so within that scope of work where recognizing that segregation can be really a matter of life and death, um, how, how, does the ma how does your organization cut into that work? What will take us through that process? Are you talking about how we're looking at um, how we can be most effective? In well, what's a day in your life? Um, what are some examples of case studies that you're battling? Um, you know, and I, I, I think what I hear from your sort of, you know, area of coverage is, you know, you're not, you're not really, um, is, it, is it correct to say that you're not actually totally majority active in the North Shore? Um, oh, that's right. Yes, we're not really active in the North Shore. Mm -hmm. um, I know our name says Massachusetts Fair Housing Center, but our our service area, we get funding from HUD, the Federal Housing Agency, to do this fair housing enforcement work. And our, our service area is confined currently today to central, you know, Worcester County West. So there are five counties, those western counties in, and central and western counties are covered by us. We have funding to begin to offer fair housing services in Middlesex County starting in May of this year. Um, and I know that the North Shore has no private fair housing enforcement agency like ours uh, available. So people in your area do not have access to the services that an organization like ours can provide. There's some hope you know, on the horizon that we will get, the, there really will be some state funding available to provide more services throughout the state. It might be coming from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And, you know, I'm always looking for ways in which we can expand our services, build our capacity and expand our services to provide, you know, at least equal access to fair housing advocacy across the state. Would, would you say, I, you know, it's been, it's been said, um, you know, there's, there's the conversation of, well, in the North Shore, and, and people say this a lot, in the North Shore, affordable housing is fair housing. Um, and, and Andrew, um, we've talked about this. Um, and this was a point of discussion between, you know, when we sort of saw our efforts going towards affordable housing, our regional president said, no, 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 we need to start with fair housing. Could you illuminate the differences there for us in terms of focus and approach? Um, and, and then maybe even talk about, I, and I, I forgive, you know, I don't have preset questions, but, you know, in the sense, do you think that the North Shore does not actually have fair housing issues that would warrant a service like what you're offering? Or is it just um, an unfortunate miss of opportunity? Um, if, for example, if we did create, let's say, let's say you changed your scope to include the North Shore, would you anticipate issues becoming visible? Because right now we don't really have in our region a visibility on fair housing issues, right? Um, yeah. I'm just gonna throw that on your plate. And <laughs> okay, so there are two questions, I think. The first one is, what is the difference, what are, what's the difference between fair housing and affordable housing? So I know fair housing advocates will tell you that affordable housing is not fair housing, in my mind, the way I conceptualize it is kind of simply that affordable housing is an element of fair housing. I mean, fair housing, I think the ultimate goals, the end point is probably that everyone has housing that is safe and adequate for their needs at, at a minimum. Um, and, but, the, the, but the housing is located in, in communities that provide opportunity and access to opportunity to all its residents. And so for me, it's kind, I, I also see it sort of spatially so that there are many communities like in our region of Western Massachusetts, Longmeadow is a very affluent majority white community, maybe um, a population of African-Americans that is around 2%. So nowhere near, doesn't match or correspond to the, you know, the um, percentages across the state. Um, and there's there's so many opportunities. So Lometo borders Springfield, Massachusetts, and so I'm just gonna 
maybe exaggerate this a bit, but Long Meadow probably has, you know, SAT scores, you know, at the 90% level. I don't know where that is right now. And Springfield is going to be down at, you know, I think 30, 40% level in terms of high school graduates taking SAT tests. I mean, a dramatic difference. So that if all the affordable housing is being built in Springfield and, uh, you know, there's higher percentage of affordable housing in Springfield than in Longmeadow. Um, so Longmeadow, let's even assume it has the 10% that is, is, is the goal under 40B. Um, it's, it's going to be way less than what Springfield has. So where you locate um, decent affordable housing is going to determine where poor people, underrepresented people have access to the opportunities that, you know, um, a community like Longmeadow can offer, you know, its residents. So where housing is located, um, you know, I'm going to say, you know, it could be life or death. It could be, do you get COVID? It could be, do you um, get asthma because of air pollution? And Springfield, I think, is, has the highest pollution level, air pollution problem in, in Massachusetts. So it's going to determine all those things. Um, but there are barriers, you know, there are definite uh, barriers to discriminatory barriers, a whole host of barriers that, pro, that, that prevent people of color from moving to Longmeadow. And so there are policies, there are exclusionary zoning policies that prevent it. There are policies that will keep out affordable housing in Longmeadow. So depriving people of access to those, there's an opportunity gap, you know, across the state. Does that make sense? I mean, do you have any other questions about, you know, this affordable housing, fair housing dichotomy? Do you, uh, first of all, begin with creating the opportunity so you can qualify for fair housing? Or do you begin with a push for fair housing? and then bring the opportunities? Uh, well, that's a really good question. I mean, because there's a, you know, there's also like a community like Holyoke, which is very, you know, there's been a history of disinvestment partially due to policies, you know, redlining, restrictive covenants. Holyoke's just been, you know, suffered, you know, tremendous disinvestment. And that's a sort of self-perpetuating cycle um, that's hard to, you know, um, overcome. And I'm not an expert in that, like sort of in development and overcoming this disinvestment. But, you know, I think that housing experts with a fair housing focus will support both place-based strategies to improve opportunities within a city like, Hol that's suffering within a city like Holyoke, as well as develop developing housing opportunities um, to everyone in a um, you know, much more affluent community with tremendous opportunities and amenities like Longmeadow. So you have to offer the housing options in Longmeadow and you have to develop, you have to de do, do development in cities like Holyoke that, because you just wanna create equal access to opportunities in every community across Massachusetts. So that might be an oversimplified view of it but I think the goal is equal access to opportunities. In some communities, they have an excess, really. Um, I don't live in Long, I can't afford to live in Long Meadow. Um, and other opportunities there, you know, um, well, Holyoke has a child poverty rate of 46%. So, you know, taking um, this knowledge and and bringing it into the North Shore, um, which is where our branch is, um, you know, we ha we're responsible for 17 towns and cities all the way from the border of New Hampshire down to Marblehead. Um, if can if I can share if I can share my screen and show you our bylaws just to give you a sense of like the sort of anchor. Um, it says here, and this is this is our governing this is our governing bylaw. It's very ambiguous, but specifically focused with a fair housing lens. It says the committee, and here it is right here. The committee on housing shall number one study housing conditions in the local community. Number two, 
can you guys hear my kids as loud as I can? Because I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm sorry if you can. Um, number two, receive and seek to address complaints of discrimination. And number three, oppose all restrictive practices, whether public or private. And four, disseminate information and render such other assistance which may eliminate discrimination in housing. That's, that's what we've been asked to pivot on and to build from within fair housing. Could, could you, and obviously Maris, like I, you know, I, I don't, this is not a training, this is just an intro, but just to give you a little bit of light into our world and what we're assigned with, just first blush, what does that look like for you? Because to me, what it looks like is number one, we put on our website a little bit of a complaint form. Hey, if you have an issue, let us know here. And then maybe we can get some um, interest coming in. Number two, we start to meet people like you, right? And we start to create relationships, right? Because if we do get an issue coming through our website portal, what do we do from there, right? And then over time, we get a real... Um, visibility on the, the traffic flow of issues. And when we say, hey guys, in the year of 2021, we had 35 issues that are all focused on claims of racial bias dealings at the mortgage office, right? Or whatever. And then we can maybe take the conversation from there. Is that sounding on the mark? Um, I think you're on mute. Oh, I always do that. Um, so I was saying in 2013, I worked closely with a new chapter in Amherst, Massachusetts, a new NAACP chapter. And they, they I mean, if I want to talk to those folks, they're very friendly. Um, I could give you some names. And um, they got involved in a case that we work really closely with them on in Amherst, where a landlord, a private landlord, who had rents that, that allowed people with section eight to live in this, I think 24 unit building. Um, he sold it to a um, you know, huge property management company in Amherst. And they immediately um, rate, double, like doubled the rent. You know, it was in Amherst, there was some large, it was, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a, 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 a government affordable housing. It was just this nice guy who just didn't um, exploit his ability to raise the rents as, a new buyer did immediately. And so families um, and some of um, some people of color that were living in that building, it was actually called, it was called Echo Village. And there's, there's, you know, there's some stuff maybe online you could find out about it because we organized to try to keep the families um, in that building, tried to bring the housing authority from Amherst in and um, weren't successful with that. Um, you know, that was sort of the private market did overrule, but we were able to, um, there was another issue that came up during this, you know, challenge that we were making to these policies within the town where the town tried to reduce the value of the Section 8 vouchers. And the organization was in place with the NAACP to have public hearings about that policy by the Housing Authority and to defeat it. You know, so they weren't able to lower the value of a Section 8 voucher that goes to low income households to allow them to live. You know, Amherst is, a, is, is an affluent community and many people like to live there, they have great public schools, you know, it's a nice place to live. Um, but with this policy that the Housing Authority wanted to enact, um, probably most of the people, low-income people who are living in Amherst with a Section 8 voucher would have had to leave. They would have been displaced. So we, we overcame that working with the NAACP. The other thing it reminds me of, Natalie, is um, so HUD, HUD as a federal agency is supposed to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, and so any agency, and any agency like ours, any agency that gets HUD funding, um, Andrew, maybe you know about this if you get HUD funding, you are supposed to actually affirmatively further fair housing in your policies with those federal funds. So that has been very um, negligently, it hasn't been enforced you know, since 1968 very well. Um, under the Obama administration, there was a strong, strong, much stronger effort 
actually have that mean something in terms of addressing structural barriers, structural discrimination that kept people um, from housing opportunities. So, but you start this process of a firmly furthering in, within municipalities say, so Holyoke gets CDBG money, they have to affirmatively further. So what they need to do is they need to analyze what are the barriers to fair housing in that municipality or in that county or that region that are preventing people from having equal access to housing. And sometimes we work on those um, projects to analyze, you know, we're asked to come in and analyze what the barriers are to full and fair housing. So um, we didn't actually work with Northampton Mass the last time, but they developed a very good analysis of it. It's called an analysis of impediments to fair housing. Um, Northampton recently did it in the last one or two years, did a pretty good job on it. Boston's done a really great job on it. Um, so Andrew, do you, do, you, do you have an idea in our area, in the North Shore, what some impediments are? I, I have to, honestly, I have to do a little bit of research. I was just asking Andrew because I know he's local. That's all. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. That's okay. I take anything. Yeah, that, no, that's a great question, man. I mean, our, our primary, our primary, um, issues are zoning. So it's, a, you know, we have dominant exclusionary zoning in many of our municipalities, to Maris's point, the overlap between um, exclusion by race and exclusion by class is um, not 100% universal, but very damn close. Uh, and so if we've effectively excluded people of color from a lot of North Shore communities by um, through, through zoning mechanisms, you know, which includes single family only zoning, minimum maker lots, um, height limits, exclusion of any kind of multifamily. Uh, and we have that in, you know, we, we could give you the list on the North Shore who that and who doesn't. Now it's a little different right now because the, the state just required that um, there's gonna be multifamily by right and community served by transit. I say that like it's a mouthful, but as short it, uh, it, yeah. Every community on the North Shore essentially is going to have to have a multifamily district. So one of the areas where uh, where there's going to be a lot of play um, in the near term is how those get established and where. Um, and so huge, yep, it's a huge, huge deal. Just it passed in the Economic Development Bill. So um, uh, which which um, you know was maybe a month ago. Uh, other things in that bill, but. Um, but that's that's we we have ex, we have created racial segregation and exclusion uh, on the north through, on the north shore through zoning. Okay, so that's, and, that's Andrew. Not Andrew, um, is there in the north shore this formal analysis of impediments to fair housing report that's ever been done? Yeah. So what? Uh, to, and Maris is right. They so under the Obama administration, they essentially took the fair housing stuff from the '60s okay, we're really gonna do this now. And they were formalizing these reports so that any community that was getting uh, federal money, which could include CDBG money or home money or you know, very, very small amounts of Fed money, we're gonna have to create this. We were just on the cusp of sort of everybody having to do it. And you can imagine it created a mechanism. It's not so different, Natalie, than what, what the school, what the education committee is doing now, right? With the local, with the state level uh, question at the NLACP level around holding communities accountable to um, the equity questions at the moment. So it's similarly, uh, if Biden goes back to what Obama required, which pretty decent chance he would through the new HUD secretary, then there'll be this push again for the communities to have to create these. To my knowledge, I don't know anyone, anybody who has one. I think what happened is the clock was ticking um, on the administration. Uh, they were supposed to do that. Communities were talking about it. A lot of them were, especially communities that knew they were going to have a problem with this, meaning um, uh, they knew that they had policies that were racially exclusive, um, you know, were, were complaining about it. Uh, and it ended up, you know, by the time the administration finished, that's uh, that it wasn't there. It wasn't in play. This was a huge question that you may have heard is that fair housing advocates like Maris and others, you know, were, were, 
and at the at the national level were really upset because Trump then under Carson removed um, essentially took the regulatory structure under fair housing legislation from the 60s and said, no, we're not going to do that anymore, meaning we're not going to require these reports. So the question is, is that going to come back again? If it does, then we can hold all the communities or almost all of them um, yeah. responsible. Um, well, well, also what it does is it takes your, because you have top level, and I've seen you in action, and I think you suffer from this. You'll go to a municipal meeting you you know this stuff you're like you're like the region's expert right I mean Maris he is actually the region's expert in housing like I'm not trying to like be big him up he really is um, Very sweet. but like I've seen but you are though and and I think that like you go to these meetings and you have this deep knowledge and you can say to them guys the problem is our zoning and the truth is they um they don't hear that so uh, my question Maris to you is can our branch maybe pressure somebody like to say, hello, HUD, hello, whoever, we would formally like an analysis of impediments to fair housing, because then we as a support group, like our housing committee could say, we'd have a HUD document that says, it's not just and Andrew DeFranza, the uh, you know uh, focus of your attacks because you're a racist, um, you know, it's more of a um, official formal document now that we can all move on. And you guys could stop biting Andrew's ankles because here's the official document that says we have this issue. So now let's move on it. Maris, is that, can you respond to that in some way? Yeah, I mean, I think these reports are usually done by these municipalities that get the CDBG funds. To the, that's the pr process that I'm most aware of. There's nothing to prevent anybody from really doing an analysis of impediments to fair housing. We've done it as a fair housing or organization with, with our HUD grant. We just said, well, how about we do some analyses in our areas? So there are planners that do it. There are people who really do have expertise in doing it that's deeper than ours. But there are also our regional planning committees, commissions. You know, We have the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that does a lot of work with all the municipalities out in Western Mass. And that you must have something in the North Shore. Do we, Andrew? Andrew? We have MAPC. You just put it on. Put it in the chat. Oh, I would. Yeah, we have MAPC up here. So, they so can, I don't know them, but they can, yeah. they can do it. So we but, could ask them. We could ask them to do that, Andrew? Yeah, you could ask, um, and they would ideologically, they would be very supportive. Um, I mean, it would, so if you were looking for a brassy response, Natalie, you could either the NAACP itself or municipal municipality by municipality could ask for uh, a report like this that's municipally based. Um, if you, you know, similar to, like I said, what you're doing with the, with the schools. So that could be done and they could essentially volunteer to do it. If you follow the mechanism with the feds we were just talking about, that was compulsory. That's why that's, you know, but it doesn't mean, doesn't mean you had to make them do it. Meaning that um, if, a, if a city or a town said, yeah, we want to do it within the rubric of our new human rights committee or whatever, and we want to get MAPC to do it, I'm sh to Paris's point, I'm sure they would, but you have to create pressure to some kind of pressure where the municipality would agree to engage it, right? Even like a housing production plan, which is usually where you see a lot of the housing conversation at a municipal level is almost always enforced because a community is worried about 40B. So there's a trigger or a, um, a pressure that creates the outcome, but you could just use, you could just look from a local political standpoint, create the pressure that will create the outcome. That's possible. So I just wanted to jump in and say that too, like it's really easy to create that pressure. Um, I mean, in my job, I do that all the time. That's like my lived experience daily as a labor organizer. That's really easy to create on a local level. Um, I mean, even by getting like an action network email link set up, I mean, local leaders, they get like 50, 60 emails and like the, the world ending at that point. Right, you could do anything with 50 emails, right? Then. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, you could like move like mountains with 50 emails. Mm -hmm. yeah. Deb, Deb, in your capacity is what I'm, 
suggesting, and Maris, you too, it, it, does this sound viable for us? Because I'm looking what I, I, I mean, this is a wonderful conversation, but I'm like so desperate to like get this going because I see the need. Would something like this be a good step in the right direction, um, Maris and Deb? I mean, I think you can do anything. I, I mean, we do a lot of work, like I said, in my local union, we do a lot of work around housing justice. And we sent like around 75, 100 emails and we got um, an eviction moratorium in place in my city. We were one of the first ones to get one in place during the COVID crisis. We've, we wrote, um, you know, last year before pre-COVID, we wrote a bunch of emails and now um, the city of Malden has, um, a fund where people can apply and get their security deposit paid um, out of the city fund. I mean, we a few emails can <laughs> really move mountains. Um, I think anything's possible with a good organizing plan and some follow through. Agreed. And probably Natalie, you could if you if you had a regional plan, meaning you, if you talk to MAPC and said, "Would you guys do this if we get the municipalities to ask for it?" They'll say yes. Then you'll have that, and then you'll you have the um, you have what the plans look like to Maris's point, meaning you know what the impediment plan looks like. You could then have X fifty people, or to Deb's point, um, in each community, go to the you know create a communication to the board of selectmen or the city council saying we would like a plan like this created, and MAPC is willing to do it. You know what what's the next step? Um, are there subtle pushbacks, uh, Andrew, that we should be aware of? Because I know it oh, yeah. can be blinding at times. For example. Yeah, they, yeah I mean, communities that know they're going to have a problem are not going to want to do it. Yeah, they're just going to flatly say no. Is well, they, I, I think it's harder for them to say no today than it was 18 months ago. Okay. Yeah, and it's going to be harder once we get on board because the reality yes. is we're all segregated. And the question that we are going to come at this with, I believe, is, hey, Essex, you have 0% Black population. Can we focus on why? I mean, really, like, I, I think we need to just, we need to be like, that's, you, you can't fall back. It's not acceptable anymore. And we need to flip that. I think we need to lead with that. Is that something in an email to a to the town people or how think, do you envision it? I think for it's like it's so in my, my mind and maybe mm -hmm. everyone else can share the their ideas of this, but I think it's going to be a bit of a strategic networking um, hunt first we we as a committee have to say okay who's going to take Gloucester. Uh, who's going to take this? Who's going to take that? And then we 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 look at the board of selectmen. We see who's favorable to this. We mm -hmm. we make phone calls with them. We see who we can get as allies. We 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 champion it. We might need to mobilize into a couple of municipal meetings, um, and we utilize the group in that way to just flex and try to get them to flip. Um, in a way that, like, you know, it can't be aggressive, right? We have to be friends. And, um, you know, um, I, I like the gentle approach. <laughs> it, hey, Andrew, I see you using this approach all the time. I see you. You bite, Is your tongue yes, bleeding yes. all the time or what? <laughs> well, I have a heavy bag in my office. Uh, I was just going to reveal that fact, actually. There's a heavy bag. And oftentimes, if you hear the punching, you go nowhere near the office. You're getting used, so Andrew. Full I don't want to be. I don't want to be in in contention with you. Is affordable ever theoretically in contention with fair housing? No. Not really. Okay, I was no, talking about no. that before and, this meeting. And just no. to be clear, just to be clear, and to speak very uh, without a filter, um, I think the the general concern with uh, you know our regional was we can't come out of, we, he, he wants the longevity of our branch to be preserved. We have to build credibility. We're a new branch. We could lose it if we get loud on an issue where we make a mistake. He, we don't want to start our housing committee on, an, on a pro affordable housing because we, it could be misconstrued as we're just pro new development, which doesn't always necessarily help people of color all the time, majority. A lot of time with the way it's being done here, you see over 55 developments that go to majority white people and it doesn't help the, the real cause of the NAACP. So really we got to start heavy on the focus of people of color. We have to start. And, and that's where 
I think, you know, Andrew and I both agree, like eventually the roads are going to meet and maybe in a year, oh, hey, we're running in total tandem with a four. And now we're now talking about a four, but we're not there yet. So we have to start firmly in that championing the race um, issue in our region, the segregation, you know, um, one of the reasons why I was so excited to get Maris to, to sort of spark our fire was her utter um, commitment to desegregating. Um, and Maris, I don't know, can we bring the conversation back to you a little bit with your rebranding of this? I think you, you know, you talked about reaffirmation, but I think you and I had talked about your own organizational reaffirmation of really claiming this space. Is this also in your heart and, and mission now? Yeah, so in 2018, we did a strategic planning process and we deliberately and intentionally decided to change our mission statement, um, which had been, um, I don't know, just kind of a typical fair housing organization mission statement to fight, you know, combat, combat housing discrimination. Um, but we decided that we really wanted to change our approach to focus on eliminating, you know, a, because I think it's doable. I actually think it's doable, eliminating systemic housing discrimination. Um, so, because it's systemic. I mean, the zoning policies that Andrew's talking about is a system, you know, that is clear and everybody knows it. Everybody knows single family zoning, minimum lots, um, no uh, multifamily as of right. These are systemic barriers to racial integration. Um, so yes, we decided that that's where we wanted to focus. What, you know, our limited, we're small, you know, our limited staffing and resources to eliminate systemic housing discrimination. So this was before George Floyd. And if any, you know, if anything, George Floyd's mur murder ca caused us to step back, take a deep breath and again, ask ourselves again, what more can we do to further racial justice because you know that's yes as, as i look at our group i notice there's nobody of color in it unless julianne is and is that an issue i know that in some other committees i'm in where there's a focus to yeah. bring in and even have leadership be of color can, can uh, i answer that can i answer that marianne the answer is no oh, sure. The answer is no, the color of our skin will not determine our ability to do this work. Um, our branch will always reflect the demographic that we're in. And right now we are 97% white. Um, mm -hmm. We as a branch will never just go hunting for people to become members based on the color of their skin. We just need to do the work. And you know, we are getting um, leadership from um, black people via the NAACP. That's a black organization that is wholly committed on race-based discrimination. And I, I think, you know, most people will agree it's really about time the white people jump on board because, you know, we're not, none of us are free unless everyone's free. And racism is not a black problem. It's an American problem. Thank you. Yeah. Um... I don't think that's typical of the Amherst group, but definitely I think um, black participation is probably in a minority because it, it really reflects, as you say, the demographics of our state, um, the counties within our state and the segregation, the high, very high rates of segregation that exist in Massachusetts today. And um, yeah, I think we all have to fight it. Yeah, and, and also this is a bit off the housing topic, but we are a unique branch within the NAACP and a lot of branches in New England. Um, you know, the way that branches start in NAACP is really in the black communities, right? So the fact that we're an anomaly where we're a, a white community that created this branch um, is, is not definitely not the typical lens. I mean, if you look at the NAACP branches within New England, it, it's within Black communities that they've been started. So we're in new, we're in new territory. Um, but just to be clear, again, we have you know you know direct instruction from the regional that we should not be concerned with the color of our skin as we do this work. Thank you, Natalie. I have to think that the very reason why we're a majority white chapter 
is exactly what we're talking about, right? Um, you know, access has yes. been. And I would, I would, I personally am excited about the opportunity to do um, an impediment to fair housing report and moving that forward because I think it calls communities to have some really scary self reflection that they don't want to have. And so if you're, you know, to, to Deb's point, if you're on a list that because you haven't responded, you're going to be obvious by your absence. You know, if, if, if you don't want to do that report, there's a reason why you don't want to do that report. And at, we're in a time where there's awareness enough that everybody knows why you didn't want to do that report. And so it, I think that alone may put the pressure on. I mean, I think about the own, my own community where I live. And I, I know technically my community isn't within that chapter um, region, I don't think. I, I'm not sure. But um, that that's a that's a question that needs to be answered by, by ours and contiguous communities um, that they don't want to answer because it's uncomfortable. Why do we need two acre zoning in this community? Why are we only single family zone? You know why? I mean, unfortunately, that's that multifamily by right is not going to impact a community like mine because we have no public transportation. Um, so once again, they skirt the obligation, right, which is really frustrating for me. So um, so I, I just I, I love the idea of it kind of bringing pressure to bear, right, to, to say, you know, and, and certainly at Harbor Light, this has been our you know, Harbor Light is sort of a social justice organization for which housing is the platform, right? So we think of ourselves as a, you know, we don't think of ourselves as a developer th first, we think of ourselves as social justice first. And this has been long part of our, um, our, our, our mission statement as well, Maris. And to your point, we rewrote our missions, rewrote it in 2017 to reflect specifically um, racial equity in, uh, in in, and fair housing across the North Shore as part of our overall like push, right? So that's sort of when we sort of flipped the obligation from social justice to housing. It's sort of the, that's the basis through which we, we execute it. And any opportunity we can, we've been in public meetings that are, you would not believe what people will say in a public meeting when, when housing is about to be created. And I know I'm sort of like, I'm migrating from the fair housing to the affordable housing. But oftentimes, and, and you know, this is where, you know, sort of that experience of standing in the public space and taking sort of the hits, as you were pointing out, Natalie, that Andrew does in meetings, is with each comment and question, it they everybody starts to reveal themselves, right? Like so so with each question and each follow-up question, they get closer and closer and closer to the reality of what they're really saying. Right, so when I hear somebody say in a particular town, we don't want this housing because it's gonna impact our water. Why is it gonna impact your water? Because the cars they have are crappy and they're going to be leaking oil and the oil is gonna run off into the wells. I cannot make that up. That actually <laughs> happened in a meeting for our late development. So, but the follow-up question is, well, why do you think that, right? Why, why, why would you assume that that would happen? And so. I, I think that this report might force that kind of a conversation. Yeah. So that is like, I don't know, it seems like a good step. Yeah, and, and, and Maris, I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I think we all said one o'clock, um, you know, so I, I don't wanna disrespect anybody's time. But, but back to your organization, Maris, you know, you're hearing all of our thoughts. I, you can see, I'm, I feel like a caged animal right now. Like I am so excited. <laughs> I mean, um, but, you know, tell us a little bit about how this energy can align with what you're doing and extend your good work because we're, you know, we really are focused on impact. It's not, it, it, it's about providing the service and the visibility to move this dial, um, um, you know, advise us, how can we get on your page? What, you know, can we continue the relationship again? Let's not, you know, answer all the questions today, but just a, just a gut check on direction of where we go from here with you and how we can help your, your work. Um, well, th thank you for that question. I, I really appreciate it because as I say, I would be thrilled to build capacity within the state across the state for fair housing. And I, I think, Deb, I, I agree with you. We can achieve great things in, in small numbers, actually. So I think it just takes um, some passion, some clear vision, 
great organizing. Um, I'm open to continuing a conversation with you. I am actively seeking funding to expand geographically as well as sort of by subject matter, the kind of work that we do. We have not for a long time um, really done exclusionary zoning. We worked on a famous case um, in Agawam around 2004 where the city of Agawam refused to grant a permit to provide farm worker housing, you know, based on race. Um, and, you know, the Department of Justice got involved in that. But I think since then, and certainly since my tenure, which began at Master Housing in around 2008, we haven't focused on exclusionary zoning rules. I would like to expand, you know, our capacity to do that because I totally agree with Andrew that those rules are really Ex, you know, excluding people, you know, that's a powerful statement to make, arbitrary exclusion, you know, based on skin color um, that's happening today, you know, clearly. And, and Bethany, um, you know, as Andrew mentioned, I was on a panel with him uh, maybe a month or so ago, and he did expose us to the litany of excuses and questions that you folks get. And it is shocking to me. It is really shocking to me. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's in that category, shocking, but not surprising. Um, but I think we do have power. I mean, and I think particularly in this moment um, to take advantage of the passion and the attention that is being paid to these longstanding issues of racial injustice. So, you know, I welcome any opportunity to do what I can to achieve, you know, the results that we should have, we should be living within now. I mean, it's just kind of outrageous where, where we're at right now. And, and there's so much that we can do working together. So I, you know, I, let's just keep talking because I mean, just having, you know, this conversation helps me think about how, you know, fair housing services can be brought to your region. Sounds like a plan. And, um, you know, I, I love that so many people were able to join today. Um, really Maris, thank you so much for the work you do. Um, I know it's, it's hard in a lot of ways um, and overwhelming because um, there's so much to do. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to build to help you lift that here in the North Shore. Um, in terms of where we are with this housing committee, um, you know, I'm going to ask everybody on this call to think about stepping up into a chair space or a vice chair space. Um, I, I, I will always be interested, um, but because I'm the, the branch president, I can't really do the heavy lifting. Um, I do, we do need leadership in this committee. Um, so think about it. Um, you know, I know you're all committed to the cause and I appreciate every one of you, but, um, you know, if, if we can identify a chair or a chair and a vice chair at some point soon, it would be great to keep the, things going. I'll, I'll continue to try to move it forward with my capacity. Um, so I think next steps for us would be to call our next housing committee meeting where we just digest all of this and, and talk about maybe next steps. Um, does that sound like a good next move for, for us? You know, Natalie, I, I'd like to envision that the next step has been more or less thought about and discussed here, which is the impediment list. I don't know how what the formal is, but I, I think we're coming to a conclusion for next step uh, we need leadership and that sort of thing, but um, I just, I think we are moving forward and I think we need to even up today. Yeah, that's a great point. I think we, we have definitely, like you said, Marianne, identified some pretty obvious next steps. I think actioning them would be the discussion. Thanks for all you do and I will give it thought. Would it help if I sent you an example of the report that I'm talking about, the analysis of impediments? Because yeah. I think there's yeah. yeah, okay. I'll, I'll send it to you, Natalie, and you can distribute. Perfect. It. Sounds good, Maris. That would be great, Maris. Thank you. Oh, of course. Good to meet you. Yeah, great, great to meet you, and good to see everyone again. Thank you so oh, much, wonderful. Maris. Yeah, wonderful to meet you all. And you really, you're doing a great thing. I mean, I just um, am really excited about you 
kind of doing this on your own, you know, coming to fair housing on your own. Um, <laughs> there's so much we can do. I was just, before I leave, um, I just find that improving housing is going to improve, you know, a whole array of aspects, you know, measures of um, quality of life for people and for families. Um, so it's, it's a neat policy area where I think you can accomplish more than even your stated goal because it's going to filter down and affect people's access to um, fresh food, recreational opportunities, differences, as I mentioned, in policing, education. So um, yeah, I look forward to um, continuing the conversation and, and I'm happy to have met you. Yeah, likewise. All right. Well, thank you, Maris. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank right. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Natalie, thanks, Happy Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you.